Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm also the conference director. I'm joined today as an interviewer. Uh, my co-host is Philip Tanzer, an amazing uh, MRA, uh, a German guy um, who's so patriotic, he's moved to the north of Scotland, uh, where he's doing fantastic work with uh, co colleagues in gender parity and of his own bat. So um, very, very impressive guy. Fantastic to have him here as co-host. And you'll be co-host on Thursday as well, I, I believe, Philip. That's so, correct. Yeah. So th that's absolutely fantastic. Our interviewee is something of a hero of mine uh, because his um, extraordinary book, The Woman Racket, published in 2008, was one of two books hey. which, was, <laughs> was, was one of two books which red-pilled me, the other one being by uh, The Essential Difference by Professor Simon Baron Cohen. Uh, but The Woman Racket is an absolutely extraordinary book. I wish I'd written it. I'm green with envy, and it should be on every MRA's uh, shirt bookshelves. Um, Steve, would you like just to introduce yourselves and introduce yourself and say a couple of words? Uh, yeah, I'm Steve Moxon. Uh, I am indeed the author of The Woman Rackets. It's a little out of date now. Sex Difference Explained is my more recent book. But that's more a tour through the science where The Woman Rackets a bit falling between two stools between polemic on the one hand and science on the other. What I mainly do is every year I do at least one major new theory paper to do with the science of the sexes, um, looking at the biological roots of uh, human sociology and psychology. So yeah, so I'm, I'm more a backroom uh, researcher writer uh, than a, a campaigner, but now I'm officially retired, this may change. Uh, Philip, do you want to kick off with the questions? Yes, and I would uh, start with a question by uh, George McConnell, and I would um, again encourage uh, Tom Golden to send his um, question into the Zoom chat so that we can, or Steve can answer it as soon as possible. Yeah, it's not here yet. So the first question uh, from George is, it seems it, um, it seems all you need to produce a group bias is to split people into groups and give them colored badges. Do you know if there is any research that indicates that males are less susceptible to in-group bias in general? Or does this only happen when the groups are males versus females? There is a male major general difference in uh, in-group bias uh, between the sexes um, uh, in, in terms of homophily, uh, you know, attraction to your own sex. Is it, uh, I get mixed up, is it Maddox and Brewer, 2004, I think the paper was, a, re a regularly cited, I never remember the damn things. <clears throat> and uh, they showed there's a 4.5, nearly five-fold sex differential. That is, uh, women overwhelmingly prefer members of their own sex. Whereas men have virtually no preference. For their own. This is a really surprising thing. You'd expect, given we males form this, uh, you know, male hierarchy, that we'd be uh, heavily into in-group bias. Uh, it, it, as it turns out, that's not the case. Obviously, we're, we're, we're only with other males in, within the dominant hierarchy. But there's no such thing. There's a lot of research on this now. There's no such thing as dominant hierarchy across sex. Dominant interactions across sex. Uh, in fact, we now know that dominus hierarchy proper is, is only, um, it's a male-specific phenomenon. Women do not uh, form hierarchies to say that are transitive. But yeah, there's a massive difference. Um, it seems that um, there's some other um, sociologists, some other male psychology, whereby they are very inclusive of the whole group to bring women and children within the you know, natal group or whatever, uh, within their sense of in-group which women don't have, because women operate very much, uh, as Joyce Benenson has written on a lot recently, uh, they, they seem to operate, they have a sociality which is based on an exclusionary principle. In fact, my next paper may be on this topic, that males essentially are about, are inclusive, whereas females are exclusive. So, answer the question, yes, there is very solid uh, research showing that there's a massive sex difference in in-grouping. But um, to expand on this question, 
uh, is there, for example, more racism found amongst males or amongst females? So do white women tend to be more racist than white men? Um, uh, do you know anything about that? Uh, it's not an area I've looked into. I understand that research does show there's more racism uh, by men, but that's what you'd expect because uh, obviously males are uh, they're the sex. They're going to be concerned with outgroup threat. That is that's the terminology. Anyways, threat from an outgroup. We know, contrary to what previously thought, uh, there's no um, uh, hostility to an outgroup unless there is quite a concrete threat. But obviously males are going to be concerned with that uh, much more than, more than females are. So you'd expect that race and being, race being one form of in-group marker, if you want to use that term, um, uh, of course there are an infinite number of, of all sorts of potential in-group. Obviously skin colour is obviously an obvious in-group marker. And we've elevated it in our culture to this, this supposedly specially heinous form of recognizing an in group marker when it shouldn't be at all. But yes, you would expect males to be uh, more likely to be, uh, in inverted commas, uh, racist than females. But I've not looked into that body of research. Okay. Um, Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yes, th th thank you. Steve, we come, come across to... clearly. Okay. Sorry, Steve. Uh, we come on to an interesting question from. Jared Casey, um, who's a retired um, professor of philosophy at um, in, yes. uh, um, in, in Dublin. Um, he, his presentation and live Q&A were yesterday, and I urge people to check them out. Very, very interesting. And uh, so both of those videos are, uh, are up on the Hoover website. Um, he asked this, Steve, what kind of response do you typically get from feminists to your ph phylogeny slash misandry thesis? They avoid me like the plague. <laughs> uh, since I came out of this, I've not really met any. Uh, they, they, they're usually extremely hostile, not usually physically, but it, it can be. But yeah, I've not really, uh, because the, the, obviously feminists don't want to talk to me. They, they, they just completely ignore me now. Uh, these two uh, send brick bats. But since I've uh, come out with a misogyny paper, I'm not sure I've had any interaction with them. Literally, I, I, they just uh, make themselves very scarce. Obviously, because they don't do any science, then there's no really common ground for discussion anyway. And they realize it'd be totally fruitless to actually uh, enter into discussion with me. So, so yeah, so the answer is, uh, it's a null response. So I've, I've, I've no interaction with feminists at all. It's interesting you say that because people are always saying to me, oh, you must come in for so much hostility from feminists. And I say, I wish I did. Quite frankly, no, they 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 ignore me because they because they can. Well, Gerard, because nobody holds them accountable. Well, I think Gerard would say the same thing. Uh, I was having an email exchange with him yesterday, and he said that uh, you know is is uh, very good. Truly, really expecting uh, particularly with the latest one on on. trans issues to get lots and lots of it's not had that uh, the standard thing now is um, uh, whether it's because they feel so secure anything which doesn't at all intersect with their bizarre world view um shall we go on to the next question uh, yes, the next uh, can question. we ask can we ask Tom Golden's question? I've, I've just spotted it in the chat. We, I don't oh, know absolutely, it. yes. So shall I, shall I read that out? Um, yes, says, please. He says, first of all, I agree with Mike about the woman racket. It really helps me see things clearly. Um, he says this, uh, I wanted to tell Steve a big thank you for a fascinating and eye-opening presentation. Wondered what he thinks is the underlying reason for such mis misperceptions, possibly gynocentrism. Uh, also, what the hell can we do about it? Sorry, you're all broken up. Could you repeat that, please? Oh, right, just a moment. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to tell Steve a big thank you for a fascinating and eye-opening presentation. I wondered what he thinks is the... Under this is from Tom Golden. I wondered what he thinks is the underlying reason for such mis mis misperceptions, gynocentrism, possibly, and what the hell can we do about it? 
Uh, ah, now what what misperceptions are you talking about? What about not perceiving existence? Sorry, I think I think we're, we're struggling and with and misperceiving the, uh, the supposed uh, rightness of misogyny. Is that what you mean? Yes. What what what? Um, wondered what he thinks is the underlying reason for such misperceptions, uh, gynocentrism, possibly. And what can we do about it? Misperceptions of what of misogyny, misogyny. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, he's my my line. Well, he's he's referring there to your presentation, so I'm not quite. It's a very good point. I'm not not hundred percent sure. Perhaps. Tom, if he's still with us, can uh, can clarify that. I see that's what's uh, given up this is my perspective all along is an evolutionary biology. Should we move on to the next question? I think, Philip, do you want to? Yep. Perspective, and you have to go deep, deep down into the origin of why. Go on, Philip. Okay. Next question, uh, Steve comes from Dan Sullivan, and his question is, have you found anything on the claim that women had to fight men to get the vote? I have found a leading women's advocate um, from 1800s opposing women's suffrage, uh, suffrage and noting that men have always given, uh, given women whatever they have wanted. So the question was, have you found anything on the claim yes, that women uh, have uh, white lots. men? Uh, yes, uh, as a big chapter central, in, in the center of the book, The Woman Racket, when I looked into I mainly drew on the research of uh, Martin Pugh, an English guy who's written several books on the female suffrage. And his line is very much what left was called a revisionist one, I suppose. He doesn't buy any of the uh, standard uh, received social history, as I don't either. Uh, it's quite clear that um, uh, most of the uh, militant, particularly the militant sense of the Jets, uh, was actually was a setback to women would have had the vote possibly earlier, were it not for the government being, in, in England, I'm talking about now, uh, the, the UK government having to be seen not to give in to uh, uh, to militancy by, by the suffragettes. Um, there, were, there were polls, of course, I don't know about in America, but certainly in the UK, and three quarters of women polled did not want women to get the vote. They wanted their males, their, their husbands, to get the vote because they recognised, everybody at the time, that the demographic deficit was male, not female, because males were being sent to, uh, in, in 14 to 18 to the trenches in, in France with that. Uh, only minority at that point of males had the vote. That's where the real demographic deficit um, lay. Women, uh, as I researched, the Monty Pugh goes on about, did have the vote uh, at the level where uh, their concerns were addressed at local level through the uh, church and the two different manor courts. And that's through time memorial back as far as you can get back to prehistory. So there never was a serious demographic deficit for women it was always for men and as soon as men um, caught up in 1918 because women were given the vote on their coattails so th there was very little resistance the resistance of course was to giving men the vote the problem was is that the government in england had to give the vote to men in 1918 because they were faced with having to massively widen the tax base in order to pay for the war which would bankrupt the country that's the excuse then used to put women, women on the coattails. But um, yeah, so, so that there wasn't really any, the parliament had already made up its mind, essentially. They were going to give the women the vote at one time. It was within the 19th century, uh, it was just a question of when, uh, obviously fearing, um, well, you know, what is, gonna, what is the voting pattern likely to be of a, of a female? They're obviously worried about that. But um, they're even more worried about the voting patterns of working class men, of course. So as far as I can see, there was very little um, reluctance of, of, of men to give specifically women the vote. It was more a general franchise problem. I, I'd, I'd like to come on to a question from, from Robert. He says, Steve, do you have any insights into why women are much better at organizing and public support for their claims than men are at both? 
So I, I well, think that means are more why, why women are much better <laughs> I mean, at organising they... and, and getting public support for their claims. Or cultivating public support, he said. Uh, well, again, this goes back to deep biology. Yeah, it goes right. You can trace it right, right back to the real roots of the biology. I mean, the female is the limiting factor in reproduction in ours, as in all species. Therefore, that is the basis of immediately why you're going to have uh, concern generically for females, uh, whereas you're not for males. And males, because their function as I outlined, obviously, is, is to be the genetic filter to address the problem of accumulated gene replication error. Uh, males compete for status, and most males are low status, and are looked down on uh, by women as uh, potential uh, pair bond partners, and uh, by other males as they're lower in the hierarchy. So, obviously, there's a very, very deep basis, as deep as it can be, for, for, for why you're going to have um, uh, contempt for men and uh, enmity towards men. I'm, I'm being off the topic here, aren't I? We talk about no, that's okay. No, St Steve, it's um, a very interesting uh, point. Steve, I, I wonder if I can... Something that I first uh, saw in, in your 2008 book, The Woman Racket, was that um, women were increasingly uh, ditching men as supportive partners in favour of the state. Um, and you made the point that, that these women are, are, are very often be, being... Um, uh, how do I put it? So they're, they're being supported by the taxes of men they wouldn't touch with the barge pole as partners. That's, <laughs> that's right. And I think you call it, it, it bureaucracy. Well, oh God. Sorry, I can't remember. Sorry, apologies to everyone. I've not been read the book for a long, for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I mean, since you're. Sorry to everyone for the for the breakups here. The situation was an awful lot of um, women. Yeah. The issue is obviously a lot of women can actually, uh, instead of forming a, a, a stable pair bond partner, can have children by an extra pair sex partner, or, or would be an extra pair sex partner if they had a regular partner, and use, uh, as I said, that the lowly males that wouldn't touch the basketball as taxpayers uh, to pay for that. So uh, they've got added flexibility. They don't necessarily need to have a pair bond partner and go behind his back to, to get impregnated by a, a, a higher mate value male, i.e. male with better genes. She can then pass off that child with a pair bond partner. She can sort of short circuit the whole thing <laughs> and just be a single parent uh, supported by the taxpayer. Uh, obviously, I don't think mo most women are like, but most women do want um, a pair bond par partner as well at least but um, sorry I'm, I'm drifting in no um i would like to move on to the next question and this question is from douglas the question reads sexism like the other word we hardly hear about now chauvinism used to mean something entirely different are we now forced to use the modern feminist definition so the question is have we been uh, have the original definitions, have they been taken away from us, or do you think we can go back to the original meanings? Scott? Uh, Steve? Oh, oh, they've definitely been taken away from us. I mean, at one point, that when he talked about the battle of the sexes, it doesn't mean anything like it means now. It was, uh, it was, too, it was raised in, in jovial terms. It was uh, a, a, a sort of a nod to understanding of, of the essential basis of sex differences, which is seen as quite comic, uh, real, but but comic. And that's where the, the term chauvinism, uh, obviously it got a bit more uh, acerbic as, as feminists a few decades ago started to use it. But as you say, uh, I've not heard anybody use that term, apart from an old film, uh, for quite a long time. Obviously, the whole notion of misogyny originally uh, uh, was just, um, you know, the, the, the relatively rare male um, who had, uh, it, it's a parallel, the, the, his female counterpart, who had a series possibly of failed romances and was rather jaundiced, or not to put it stronger than that, towards the opposite sex. It wasn't uh, uh, usually sort of as a, regarded as a hatred. Uh, now, of course, of course, the definition is completely ideological. It's of universal male virulent contempt for the opposite sex. That's that, you know, the, the putative phenomenon 
which, as I outlined, uh, doesn't exist. So it could not have changed more, really. I mean, it's, it's uh, the term misogyny, as it was formerly used, uh, along with chauvinism, bears very little resemblance to, to the terminology today. You know, it's it's interesting um, that, and that, I doubt, that the, the... Uh, well, I think we'll get back to it. But I think I know Mike. <laughs> Sorry, so, so, sorry, sorry, Steve. Uh, this is qu there's quite a big break in your signal here. Um, I suppose the number one criticism that people level against uh, these conferences and my party and myself uh, is, is one of misogyny. It's a very lazy thing. Uh, we've probably had I don't know three hundred presentations um, across the ICMIs and maybe fifty more at Elizabeth Hobson's Messages for Men conferences. And um, every now and again, when someone puts this charge of misogyny to me, I ask them to try and find one sentence out of maybe, I don't know, 400 hours of presentation, and nobody has yet come up with one sentence. And, uh, but I used, to, I, used to, I, used to, I used to find at Speaker's Corner that the, you know, when, when I was charged with being a misogynist uh, by a woman, it was always because I was challenging, I was challenging her. And some women, and very often, it would be a feminist with her male partner next to her, and, and it was always the same. The man was just dying of embarrassment at the bullshit, that is, but he couldn't say anything. Um, and of course, she, she trot out the misogynistic line because it, obviously she was just never, she, I guess she was told that, that she was not a complete genius and, um, and nobody had ever held her to account. I would like to say something in regards to- Well, of course, the definition now of sexism I would like to say something in regards to chauvinism because uh, it is correct. We haven't heard this term in a long time. With one exception, there was, there is or was an organization mainly in America called the Proud Boys and they called themselves Proud Western Chauvinists. And people misinterpreted that as in women haters. Um, and they had to clarify again and again that it is uh, strong patriotism, actually, the original meaning. Um, but last year, the Proud Boys, due to, I would say, almost no fault to their own, were labeled a terrorist organization uh, because they were fighting against Antifa, a far left organization. So as soon as somebody was uh, calling themselves chauvinist, um, they're being taken down. And who, Sorry, who, that who who accused them, Philip? Uh, Philip, I'd put money. That was the S Southern Poverty Law Centre. The Sub uh, Southern Poverty Law Centre uh, had their part in it. Um, but in addition to that, it was the Biden administration before they actually came into power. And Canada, under Justine Trudeau, they labelled the Proud Boys um, a terror organisation. Uh, and I, I would like to read out the next question. And this question is from Mr. 0303. His question is, thanks for your research, Steve. Do you think universities have contributed in turning science into an orthodox in institution rather than a method of investigation? I have noticed this in physics and we're all seeing it in medicine. What is your take? Well, clearly there's a massive problem with universities. Uh, I, I've obviously not been in one, <laughs> well, not until this. I did BSc in psychology years ago before this crap uh, emanated. But, uh, but um, I know there are a lot of people now saying that um, the identity politics totalitarians are going for biology. Um, in quite a big way, but for, for fairly obvious reasons. Um, I don't know the situation in physics, but I, I, I know uh, somebody who teaches education you know, who comes from a physics background uh, and uh, is full of all this, uh, uh, well, he doesn't say it's critical theory, that's basically what, uh, what it amounts to. And yes, I understand, um, I know someone's really masking but I understand it. It's uh, afflicting maths as well. It's hard to consider how it could afflict maths, but apparently, apparently it is. So yes, it's uh, uh, a lot of people now are talking about um, that the whole uh, academy has been turned on its head. Effectively, uh, it's been raised in this conference, of course. 
uh, that um, uh, well, with the, the last uh, Q and A, indeed. Um, that uh, the, the line is right. Well, you, you've got to, you've got, you've got, um, you've got to, you can conclusion. And uh, how do you find it? So you're almost looking for You know, in science, you're supposed to avoid confirmation bias. Now, oh, the accent is is actually on finding. You're looking for confirmation bias, which is obviously a complete bastardization of the scientific approach so it's i would like to say something here alarming, Steve. clearly um our uh, our previous guest terry white was talking about that very issue in the q a as well so everybody who is interested in critical theory um in academia you should also watch terry white's talk and the q a as soon as it's um online mm. sorry I Steve mean to interrupt you no that's that's, that's, what, that's what i was referring to okay uh, um can i come on to um a question from a canadian friend don loffendale w welcome don always great to see you um D D don and i met first through um chat rooms and so on at um the regarding men website for anyone who doesn't know that's regardingmen.com um and for just five dollars a month you have access to plenty of meetings other resources a cyber shed which is open 24 7 365 and i happen to know they've they've saved men's lives um um with i don't want to go into too much detail but it's an amazing thing so i strongly recommend pe people people join that um so so he asked this uh, great book steve how long have you been red pilled and what's your story yeah. yeah, I've never really fully grasped what this red and blue pill thing. I never watched the film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must. But I do understand what it means. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a lot long in development, really. I mean, I started, I, I started um, initial research for what became the Woman Racket back in circa nineteen ninety five, but really from the mid eighties, I'd had various encounters with uh, rather nasty feminists in Leicester where I lived. Uh, so I used to run music venues uh, and these to, to try to want to, to cause trouble. And uh, I did have a uh, woman friend who was sort of on the cusp of girlfriend sort of thing, uh, who um, falsely accused me of sexual assault, uh, not to the police or anything, but informally, uh, but then retracted it. So I actually didn't lose friends that way. Uh, and and, and it, Sorry, she was honest about it in the end, uh, but that's certainly it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, being a, a a low status, short, uh, fairly ugly male, <laughs> and obviously <laughs> it's, it doesn't take much seeing that uh, the whole idea that uh, males are uniformly privileged and women aren't is, is obviously a complete load of horseshit. So so I, I, I've known that for a long time. But yeah, the eighties when. Um, Pavement politics, as it was called at the time, if you remember, uh, the idea that instead of uh, fighting the class war, the left were going to fight wars in terms of groups, uh, and local Labour Party organisations started filling, filling, filling up with feminist things. That's when I first noticed things. This is before we'd ever heard the term identity politics, of course. So it's long been in, in developing. Um, but yes, yeah, certain personal experiences had something to do with it. But general uh, political media living in an inner city area in England, uh, doing all that pavement politics thing. Uh, then, of course, when I started researching it, then things fell into place. And then, of course, I was on a, effectively on a different planet to everybody else. You know, I talked to people about these things and they wonder what the hell, what, what I've been on. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah no it was certainly i mean it was as i say it was, it was the book that red pilled me um and it, i guess even today most people would really struggle to to think that there could be any possibility that you're right but but i i guess i mean hopefully you've seen over the years steve that uh you, you're getting more and more support and uh, from, from people uh to an extent um 
to an extent, I'm not, so I'm, I don't feel quite as out on a limb uh, as I was. And of course, I did, re- the world of the book, I mean, I was um, uh, influenced to, uh, to an extent. I mean, part, I'd already got most of the, of the one racket sorted, but then I came across Warren Farrell's book, The Myth of Male Power, mm-hmm. which is sort of like a social science take on what I was, was seeing from a biological perspective, which is interesting. Then I, I communicated with Warren and realised we got things in common. And also a book called Not Guilty. Do you remember that? There's a, a guy, and of course, the guy who was at Messages for Men, Neil Linden. Uh, his book, he was the no. first guy, he was, he was a regular columnist for the Sunday Times at the time. This is back the, in the 80s, the, or even the, 70s. The, Sun, the Sunday Telegraph, I think. But then, um, no, no more sex war. I think. Um, a minute, I've just uh, pulled my... Sorry, say that again. So, uh, Neil Linden, well, he was with the Sunday Telegraph, I think he's I just pulled my head But, 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 but the book was No More Sex War, yeah. I think. And he's actually, um, he's, he's, he's republished it with a lot of content that the publisher right. had taken out. Yes. Well, it, it, I read his book fairly early on. That was the first book. I thought, hang on, there's a guy who's thinking, one guy here, thinking uh, along not dissimilar lines to me. Then, of course, I read Not Guilty. But then, of course, obviously, his, his uh, tale about that, that was an extremely woeful one. He, he's lost all work. Uh, and it was quite a dreadful experience. So I, I knew what I was likely to uh, let myself in for, but... Uh, yeah, it's um, it's uh, so yeah, it's it's quite it was decades in, in uh, getting my head to go of it, and then of course I went through a transition that um, moving away to an extent from the polemic into the science because um, not only was the science more interesting, but of course it gave a solid base to. Uh, I know you can't base ideology on uh, on on science, but but uh, you can know what ideology is crap to understanding science of human nature to get it the other way around so it gave me some confidence that i wasn't entirely on well i knew that my opposition was on the wrong lines put it that way can i, can I just i just um yeah be interested to just say a few words on how slowly all this stuff works neil linden's book now is 25 years ago uh things have only got worse since but if you go back it's more than that isn't it um i thought it's late 90s but anyway um but the but, uh, but book I'd very much like to mention um, is something that I think is an absolute perfect, it's not a big book, but it's, it's a perfect little book um, called uh, The Manipulated Man by Esther The Manipulated Bidart. Man. Um, and uh, she wrote this book in 1971. Um, Amazon have taken down the, um, Amazon have taken down English language copies uh, you can buy it still from through Google Play or something or other. So that's, um, but it's it's a, it's it's an extraordinary thing. You know, f- fifty years ago, uh, and uh, she is still to this day. I understand she's a German slash Argentinian woman uh, back in Germany. She still gets. She's now in her eighties. She still gets death threats to this day. I understand. I'm told by. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm not surprised that she still gets death threats because her language is so clear so um brutal in many ways that um it it is i would say meant to offend but if you very similar to paul elam's work if you actually read what they are saying um it's not misogynistic it's not no. hateful um it is clearly truth uh written in a very clear and unapologetic uh, language. And I would say that especially Esther Villar does not hold punches against women. It, 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 no, and she, she, she's also sometimes in the book, laugh out loud funny. I mean, just hilarious. There are lines in there that will slay you. It's, about, it's possibly, it's possibly the most honest book ever written about the sexist. I, I think it's really all of it. And obviously there's no science there. And I think she's, got some things quite wrong uh, but the general tenor of it is is, is just like an arc light uh, so illuminating the reality of the I, it's it's an astonishing book obviously yeah. Yeah. I mean, I people to get it was it. before, it, it, was yeah. before or, it was it was before um 
any real extreme feminism. So when she, so it wasn't necessarily that brave. And at the time she wrote it, uh, she wouldn't have expected to get it uh, uh, as much in the neck. I think getting it, getting it in the neck for her was something that would be developed to the eighties and nineties and beyond. I'm, I'm told by the London publisher at the time in seventy one. Yeah, uh, which is, it was only the year after the only the year after the the uh, uh, Greer's first book came out, isn't it? So, yeah, uh, exactly. So, yeah, so no, it, looks, I, I, it looks probably braver than it was. I, I was just going to say, um, the London publisher told me that um, uh, Amazon simply took down the English language editions um, without explanation. But it was the 50th anniversary, so I guess that's, you know, that's it. The feminists could do without that getting publicity, but... Um, Published yeah. again. Uh, I would like to move on to the next question, uh, which is from Douglas. In the early part of your talk, you mentioned the evidence on group preferences the sexes had. Does sexual orientation make any difference to these measures? And was any part of the measurement connected with sexual attraction? Or was it just about social interaction? Uh, the latter, and yes, uh, well, it, it is an interesting question. Um, I've not really investigated about sexual orientation simply because, uh, of course, uh, the actual incidence of uh, uh, homosexuality is much lower than is, is we are led to believe. I mean, if you average out uh, recent studies, it's for males, it's what one to three percent. It's generally agreed at the, the rate the the Prevalence of that's the right word we should use. Prevalence of homosexuality in females about half that of the male. So we're only talking about a, a quite small minority, not the uh, <laughs> the ten percent that uh, obviously the, 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 the gay rights lobby would have us believe. So I've always regarded um, uh, I've got you know bigger fish to fry than lo looking at. Uh, though of course in, in in certain topics, looking at, um, uh, at gays and lesbians can be highly illuminating. Actually, you know, exceptions between the rules. Uh, but yeah, I've not looked into um, gr groups and uh, sexual minorities, we now call them. Uh, sh so, should, yeah, I don't know. Should I give my opinion? Uh, since mm. I grew up in the LGBT community, I think I can say something Please to do. that. Um, I, I would say because I had a same-sex attraction ever since I was young, I never wanted to protect women. Uh, so I was kind of born red-pilled and I would think that is the same for um, all or mo almost all homosexual men. They have a stronger in-group bias and uh, are more interested in men, obviously then the sexual component like or the sexual attraction component goes on top uh, of that. So gay men will probably care more about other gay men and then they will treat uh, men and women relatively equal. Um, I have to say that the highest level of real misogyny I have experienced in the gay community because for many reasons, because they look at the behaviors of women uh, more neutral. So they see when a woman behaves badly, they just see it as bad behavior or they copy the behavior and um, act as badly as um, annoying women. In, on the side of uh, lesbianism, uh, I would say that the percentage of feminism, um, like radical feminism is way higher amongst lesbians mm. than amongst heterosexual women. And you will see that in political feminism, a lot of the leading people are lesbian women and they're usually most radical. Um, and we mentioned that earlier, Mike, you and, you and I, we mentioned that earlier in the topic on abortion, mm. that um, lesbians fight really, really hard for abortion rights, even though it has literally nothing to do with them. Um, so I would say that lesbian, but, but I would say that lesbians have a very strong focus on women's rights, but they are also often more realistic in regards to bad female behaviors because uh, female on female violence is, um, is quite high 
and they can't hide behind the concept of patriarchy. I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. I think that lesbians have a strong in-group bias, but are more realistic on female violence. And gay men, I would say, have a stronger in-group bias than heterosexual men. Sorry, that was a monologue. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, no, I'd just like to say, and I know Steve knows this, that, that um, there's far more violence in lesbian couples than in uh, straight couples. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, considerably more. Uh, I mean, there's different views. I mean, in some way you think, ah, uh, if they're um, uh, same sex oriented, are they not actually more like their biological sex than, uh, than straight people or are the opposite? And uh, it's complicated because then, um, I mean, for the lesbians, of course, you've got, uh, you've got three different, uh, the same with gays, you've got different categorizations of sexual orientation. Uh, you've, got, you've got some uh, hyper masculinized uh, lesbians, some lesbians that aren't masculinized, and some which are in between. And you've got a similar typology, I understand, um, uh, amongst uh, male homosexuals as well. So you would expect quite different psychologists and possibly different group orientation psychology uh, according to those subdivisions. So it, it could be quite complex. But yeah, I agree. I think it's much more click up with lesbians than, than, than with gays. Um, the last, uh, at the moment, the last question that we have in the chat, uh, so please, um, attendees, uh, feel free to send more questions. We have a little bit more time, about 10 minutes. Uh, the next question is uh, about a study that you talked about, and the question is from Richard the Lionheart. I love the name, by the way. Uh, can you post a link or the name of the authors and the title to that Wenderberg et al. 2015 study. Yes, it's um, if you go on my website, if you look at uh, uh, several, it's uh, if you look in the references, it's in several of my papers. It's uh, 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 Vandenberg, Lambeles, and Kushner, Stephen Kushner from uh, Netherlands, 2015 paper. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, de, yeah, and Lambalais and Kushner. But uh, it's, it's in the, the reference section on my website or on the New Mail Studies website where my papers are. You'll find it in several, probably about half of my recent papers. Doug, um, Douglas asks, this is Douglas Wallace, who's speaking later in the week. Um, it, the Douglas is, is um, I, I should just say here, is that rare thing, rare person, um, an active MRA, with a huge interest in the international side of, of all this, and he points really very convincingly in his in his um, in his talk to the United Nations and how influential they are. So we, we we tend to be concerned with things at a national level, but he's pointing out the influence of the United Nations in particular on national governments is extraordinary. Um, uh, so Douglas says, given your findings, Steve, that men aren't particularly liked by women. Does this point towards monogamy being an unnatural state for men? In, then in brackets, I'm being deliberately provocative. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> monogamy, uh, it, it's just a residual thing, isn't it, really? Um, uh, I mean, we know that, I've, I've written two I've got the, the, the latest uh, papers actually on, uh, on uh, human mating as well. Uh, we know that uh, um, pair bonds, uh, evolved in the female rather than the male interest, contrary to what um, uh, ideologues uh, in, in, insist on. Uh, complicated reasons that I've outlined in my paper, uh, and I've been struggling because it's a bit, in, a bit complicated to actually summarise the paper's findings. But yeah, um, I mean, obviously, um, the, the, looking through phylogenetic history, 40% of all men never reproduced. So uh, a lot of men went partnerless and certainly without a monogamous pair, pair bond partner, uh, completely all, all their lives. Uh, so, um, uh, but probably always um, a slight majority I would have thought of men uh, had pair bond partners. Of course, a minority uh, had uh, multiple 
parallel pair one partners, they were the polygynous, polygynous, that's called. Uh, but uh, a lot of men, uh, for, for want of getting any sex at all, are more or less uh, obliged. <laughs> to enter into a, a monogamous, you know, a single pair bond uh, union, uh, just to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, have sexual access at all. So you could argue that to, to some extent it's a, it's a forced choice uh, for men. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a very complex subject, uh, human mating, with uh, lots of extra pet sex going on and all sorts of different dynamics. Uh, uh, so, yeah, read my new paper. I'll outline it all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the last question to you, Steve, and it's a question uh, from my side. Uh, my question is, do you think that feminism is intrinsically tied to the false belief of rampant misogyny? So do you think from the very, very early stages of feminism, um, it was built on the false perception of women that whatever happened to them uh, was um, misogyny from the man's side. No, um, because uh, if you trace back the history, uh, I've written a paper on this. So, uh, uh, I've got a se separate section on the website, which is mythology is ancient and contemporary. And obviously our contemporary mythology is identity politics and totalitarianism. If you look, look trace back to the now near 100 year history of that, where the, the, the core of identity politics, which was feminism, uh, how that originated was uh, obviously, as we all know, the Frankfurt School, Central European Marxist intellectuals, um, they realized there was a big problem with Marxian philosophy in that uh, predictions, prescriptions, uh, were not apparent. Uh, the Ruskies had had a revolution despite being semi feudal whereas the Western proletariat and their advanced capitalist countries hadn't. How do you explain that? Ah, there must be something wrong with the workers. The workers have been borrowed, bogus notion from Freud here, repressed by capitalism, as if capitalism is a form of trade has got any, any psychogenic power. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. But the upshot of that is, the idea was, we can't have the workers as the vanguard of the revolution anymore, because obviously they're not. They're refusing to be the vanguard of the revolution. What can we replace them with? Ah, well, if they're repressing their families, then we can replace them by women. Oh, hang on a bit. Um, women don't tend to march in the streets and take up arms. That's a bit difficult. So anyway, this crap went exported to, because of Hitler, explained them basically, running before Hitler got there, to the States, and it melded with postmodernism. he got Herbert Mackey's. Then in the 60s, uh, the New Left obviously realised they've got a problem with this vanguard idea. Ah, let's co-opt the civil rights movement and the snowball movements. They've got their men, you know. You know they're people who can uh, march this fix the second bomb and bring about the revolution. So if you ally those to women, then we've actually got, got a, a, a believable vanguard. And of course, from that point, 1970 onwards, we've got the now boringly familiar triumvirate of women uh, and, well, originally blacks, extended through no logical argument for white minority, and gays extended again through no log logical argument to the lesbians, LGBTQ, asterisk, exclamation mark, uh, and that's how we ended up. So no, he didn't start or develop for a long time with anything to do with misogyny. It was uh, it was from the hatred of the uh, left elite for ordinary people en masse. Effectively, the workers have been retrospectively stereotyped as male plus white plus heterosexual, really. So the misogyny thing is quite a recent ex development of extreme feminism. Don't know how far you trace it back. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't remember any of this big enmity towards men uh, when even, you know, like, vaguely, I don't know, older, I remember obviously Jermaine Greer's book coming out uh, and there was the, the, the bra burning in the streets, but it wasn't particularly anti-men at that time, if I recall right. Uh, it, it was only really a decade or two later even that um, this real anti-male stuff came through. Am, am I wrong? But would you, would, would you... I'm, I'm too young to have been there, of course. Um, or we, are, we all are. We all are. 
Um, obviously, the Marxist needed. Oh, for me. And Mike, you've only two years in the me. <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously, the Marxist needed the narrative of an oppressor. And to oppress somebody, you have to hold the other person or the other group in disregard. And all the, let's say, patriarchal institutions like marriage and uh, I would say motherhood or like women being forced to be mothers were coined as intentional oppression of women instead of actually protection of women. We, we know that marriage is in fact to protect women and children, not to oppress them. And I would say that early on, they had to twist Absolutely. this around. This institution is actually built on disregard towards you and let's say hate towards you rather than care towards you. Would, would you not agree with that? Yes, but I don't think it's, it was emotionally charged with the current virulence of okay uh, of misogyny we see today. We've seen for quite a long time now, a couple of decades. I, I, I just don't get the feeling that, that when I was, I remember the university in the mid seventies, and it wasn't there either. Uh, even by that stage, I think you'd have to. As I say, I think I date it back to the time when uh, politics. Uh, changed from much more from party politics to, to what, what we termed at the time pavement politics in the very late 70s early 80s I, I think we didn't really have this emotive nastiness towards men until that point uh, steve, but i may steve, be wrong steve, steve steve i'm sorry but we're going to have to wrap up shortly just I just want to read out a couple of quick comments from a couple of people uh this hatred um douglas says it was there sorry don loffendale who's, who i said was canadian said i i saw the hatred by 1974 in university and douglas says it was there by the mid 1970s at least and he's referring there to to the uk uh, this um, morning... so I'm, I'm afraid we're gonna have to oh. wrap it up wrap it up there the american team is about to take over the for uk the next, right sorry the american team is about to take over for the next eight hours so um i'd just like to thank um thank you steve um, can i can i can i just say that um, uh, can i can i just say that uh, I'm not very good uh, on uh, spoken stuff coming out like this. Much better you read my papers. They make, they are much more cogent than okay. I am in real life. All right. Well, just, just <laughs> want to say, I just want to say for any, as they, every MRA should have this on their bookshelf. It's also, you know, given where we are in the calendar, it's also the perfect present for um, friends and families, especially for any feminists you happen to know. They will totally appreciate it. Um, and they'll, they'll read. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank. So thank you, Steve. That was really interesting. Um, and thank you, uh, Phil, for being my co-host today. I look forward to you being my co-host again on Thursday. You've been a brilliant co-host. Um, and thank you for everyone who's joined us. Um, and it's good goodbye from me and goodbye from Philip. And I can we'll sit back and enjoy the conference now. Yes, you can. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, th th thanks for all the questions and the comments, and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Bye.